So let's go back to the history so people have got my involvement. Perfect. So I started doing sports science in 1981. That's when I really became committed. And the first thing we studied was hypoglycemia during exercise, because I was sure that hypoglycemia developed during exercise. And at that time, people were being encouraged even not to drink water during marathons. It was, it was quite a long time ago and quite different. And so we started experimenting and our focus was on the Comrades Marathon, which is 90 kilometers. And it was, became very clear that some elite athletes developed hypoglycemia and really struggled. And then there were examples of where they took carbohydrates and were able to finish the race comfortably, having slowed down, and then they take the carbs and then they do well. Mm. And so I was totally committed that carbohydrates were essential for exercise. And I bought into the idea that muscle glycogen depletion causes fatigue during prolonged exercise. So I went along with this and wrote the book Law of Running, and it's all full of carbohydrates. You must eat every single carbohydrate you can see you must eat, and you must load up on carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And the last time I wrote it was 2002. Now, my career took a major change in 2010 because uh, I learned about the low-carb diet. So I changed that, that day, and within four months, I'd, my health had improved dramatically. I'd lost a lot of weight. My running was improving. And I started telling people that, listen, I've gone to this low-carb diet. Here's a guy who's promoted the high-carb diet, and I've now gone to a low-carb diet. And I wrote some articles, and the first response was I lost all my funding, like that. And I was killed. I was dead, dead in the water. Wow. So, And then my university kicked me out. Well, they didn't kick me out, but I just retired, and they exposed me in the press and say I was, a, I was no longer believable because I was promoting a diet on the grounds that it reversed type 2 diabetes, and that was a ridiculous claim, and so on. And then it's, I had to go to court to fight for four years because what they'd done, they tried to destroy my career. Now, during this time, low carbs, my type 2 diabetes reversed, and eventually in 2018, I won the case, and it was all over. And for once, I'd actually learned a bit about nutrition. <laughs> I thought I knew about human nutrition, but I really didn't. Because in medical school, we don't really learn it. And I'd maybe studied carbohydrates during exercise, but I didn't understand the whole, the whole body nutrition. And produced a really good paper showing that the crossover point shifted far to the right to about 85% PO2 max, which is when you're not meant to be burning any fat. So we published that one. And then the most recent paper, I said, well, okay, if it works at five kilometers, maybe it'll work at one kilometer because that's a real test. So we did the one kilometer time trials and found no difference. And I, but I'd warned him. I said, but if you find no difference, what the people will say, it's because the, the athletes had lots of glycogen. Even though on low club diet, they had enough glycogen for 1K. Then I said, so why don't you do six times 800 meter repetitions? But I didn't say, and he decided to do this by himself, on his own, I didn't say measure oxygen consumption and metabolism, hmm. which was the key thing. So anyway, surprise, surprise, there was no difference because what should have happened, according to the traditional hypothesis, after about three sprints, 800 meter sprints, their performance should have gone down in the low carb group because they've got no more glycogen left. You can predict they'd run out of glycogen after about three 800 meter repetitions. It didn't happen. They stayed exactly the same regardless of diet. But then the real killer was that they measured the, the oxygen consumption and the respiratory quotient from which we can calculate, as you know, carbohydrate and fat oxidation. And the car fat oxidation just went up and up and up and up and up. So the more repetitions they did, the higher the, the fat oxidation. Hmm. And by chance, by chance, they were exercising at 86% VO2 max. And the textbooks say at 85% VO2 max, you burn no fat. And the car fat oxidation just went up and up and up and up and up. So the more repetitions they did, the higher the, the fat oxidation. Hmm. And by chance, by chance, they were exercising at 86% VO2 max. And the textbooks say at 85% VO2 max, you burn no fat. <laughs> That's what the textbooks say. The highest rates of fat oxidation in history, exactly the point where they're not meant to be burning any fat. So... It's fascinating. So what that shows is that muscle glycogen doesn't have an obligatory role during skeletal during exercise performance. There's no obligatory role, e even at these and high intensities, which is even which at is really current, the focal yeah. point here. Yeah. When one goes back and looks at the original studies, which claim that there's this 
specific obligatory role for carbohydrate for muscle glycogen. In those original trials done by the Scandinavians in 1967, they showed that at the point of exhaustion, even though the guys had low muscle glycogen, their blood glucose levels were incredibly low. I looked at those same studies and I looked at their metabolism at the point of exhaustion in people eating a high carbohydrate diet, mixed carbohydrate diet, and low carbohydrate diet. Th there were big differences in muscle glycogen at exhaustion, which doesn't fit the model. There were big differences in fat oxidation at exhaustion, which doesn't fit the model. And there were big differences in carbohydrate oxidation. But the one thing that wasn't different was the blood glucose concentration. And so you need to look at the variable that's not different, that is the same, because that's what is going to be the limiting factor. And it was very clear that it was blood glucose. I then went and looked at a whole bunch of other studies. And I, and I now know that when you take carbohydrate during exercise, or you carbohydrate load before exercise, all that happens is during exercise, you substitute a little bit more carbohydrate for a little bit less fat. And the kilojoules are, are absolutely matched. So if you burn an extra, let's say, five or eight kilojoules per minute, which is a trivial amount, it's a trivial amount of carbohydrate, you burn eight kilojoules of fat less. And what we've been told since the 1980s, since the sports drink industry got involved, they said, without measuring it, they said, but that's the difference. It's this extra carbohydrate that you're burning in the muscles this makes you perform better. Hmm. But so now if someone must tell me why burning eight kilojoules per minute more of carbohydrate, which is only 10, 15% of the total energy that you're expending at that time, why is that so special that you couldn't make it up with fat? Mm -hmm. And what we've proven now is that you could make it up for fat, but what was happening was these people were hypoglycemic. And that's, if you take carbs, you can go longer. Uh, because you, your blood glucose is higher and your brain still functions. That's what I know. And it's, uh, so I'm working very hard on a, a couple of articles which, which really definitively show that it's, it's blood glucose, which is, the, which is the obligatory fuel. It's not muscle glycogen. Through, through this research, our seeing is that the body can adapt from the carbohydrate reliance towards the fat reliance at all intensities of exercise. It used to be believed that above a certain threshold of effort, you have to run on carbohydrates. And you've now shown through your research that that is not true. And what we do as physiologists, as, as you know, we say it doesn't matter if it's the carbohydrates coming from the muscle or from the bloodstream, the regulation is the same. And that's totally false. Mm. And it took me a long time to realize it. So what happens during exercise, your muscle glycogen drops down as a sort of linear function of the, the duration, which tells you largely that the exercise is regulating how much glycogen you are using, but it's going down. It's always going down. I did not know until six months ago that the glucose that's coming out of the liver into the bloodstream is now circulating to the muscles and it's getting used by the muscles. But the regulation is totally different. Why? Because blood glucose oxidation just goes up, increases. And that's paradoxical because you don't really want that to happen because the poor liver is becoming more and more depleted of glucose and glycogen. It's having more and more difficulty to produce glucose. And the muscles are saying, I don't care about you. I want that glucose. And ultimately, you will always reach the state where the muscle demands more glucose than the liver can provide, and your blood glucose will fall. Now, the brain's not so stupid that it says, okay, the blood glucose is falling, we must just continue until you die, because the glucose in the bloodstream is crucial for all the brain function. And so the brain has a protective mechanism. And in all these studies, you can see as the glucose starts to drop, the power output of the athlete starts to drop as well, and they start to get the fatigue symptoms. But if you give them glucose, after 10 minutes, their glucose starts to rise, and they feel fantastic, and they can go on for a long time. What we've shown is that the blood glucose is, is crucial, and that the body will burn the glycogen, but it could burn fat for everything. 
So why doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the body just burn fat? And one of the keys that I observed was that in the studies where people are studied at rest, 50% of the energy is coming from carbohydrate. Now that does not make sense because this is the jet fuel that the body is trying to conserve. And that's why you're filling your mouth with carbs to provide the muscles with carbs and glycogen. And the body's wasting it mm -hmm. by burning it at rest. And when you're sleeping, why? And the answer is very simple. And it's provided by George Cahill, who, who wrote this in 1971. He gave one of the famous lectures in 1971. And he said the first rule in metabolism is that the body regulates the blood glucose concentration and keeps it within a narrow band. And, that, and everything's focused on that. And as soon as the glucose goes out of sync, the body responds dramatically to try and get it back into range. The one way you can get the glucose back into range very quickly is you dump the glucose somewhere and you dump it into the muscles. Hmm. And then the body is so clever that it says, okay, we've got too much glucose or glycogen in the muscles. I know you're going to go out and have another Coca-Cola and you're going to have some chips and bananas in three hours time. I've got to anticipate that. I've got to get rid of this glucose in the muscles. So the next load that comes in, I can store it. And that's what's happening. The only reason you burn glucose is to regulate your blood glucose concentration. That's why you burn glucose. What happens in the body is that the muscles respond. And if they've got lots of glucose, they will burn glucose. They have to. And the only way you can stop that is by not eating carbs. And then your muscles are full of fat and very little carbohydrate. And then you will burn fat. And something which I didn't really catch on to until two years ago. We studied an athlete who was a, as a low carb athlete, but it was a really good athlete. And so that he could cycle at a very high rate from the moment he cycled. And we had him do a hundred K time trial. And from the instant he got on the bike, he was burning 1.7 grams of fat per minute, which normally, if, as you know, if you're carbohydrate adapted, you would never get anywhere near that. But if you're not if you're carb adapted, you start at 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and it takes you hours, hours and hours and hours to get anywhere near. But the moment he got, he was burning 1.7. Well, we, we subsequently did studies to prove it, that the content of muscle glycogen depend, determines how much fat and carbohydrate you burn. So now the final little story. So I went back to those original studies, the 1967 studies, and I looked at the group who were on the low-carb diet. And although, although they could only exercise for about an hour, they had a rate of fat oxidation, which was higher than anything that had ever been reported. But they didn't notice it hmm. because they were focusing on the carbs. Yeah, and so from the word go, they were burning a whole lot of fat. Now, they were not fat adapted, which oh, is the sure. other interesting point. These people were, were athletes or, or probably just general people. Well-trained. I, I think they were policemen or something. I can't recall what they were. Mm -hmm. But they were they were burning fat even without being fat adapted. And so so how what do I interpret that to mean? That I interpret it mean that the body's designed to burn fat. And it, the only way you don't burn fat is if you're eating a high carb diet. So the natural state is to burn fat. You don't need to train for it. It develops. And Louise Burke has shown that. She took some Olympic athletes who are high carb athletes. Within five days, they were burning 1.6, 1.7 grams per minute. They didn't need to go out and train. Okay, because glucose is obligatory for the brain. And, and that's why I think that the glucose oxidation goes up during, blood glucose oxidation goes up during exercise. That shows it's obligatory. You can do what you like. You can't stop it. You can take all the carbs you like. You won't stop this. It's going to go. And you can start exercise carbohydrate depleted. And the rate of blood glucose oxidation is the same. So it's, it's fulfilling some obligatory role. And obviously part of it's brain. Some of it may be kidneys. Some of maybe other tissues, and it may also be obligatory for muscle. That that's, I'm not going to exclude that, mm. but it's such a tiny amount that uh, it's not as we used to think that it's the predominant source. It's a tiny, tiny amount, and I'm not excluding the possibility that you need a little bit of carbohydrate to keep muscles working properly. So one of the other studies I looked at in detail was the first study to show that carbohydrates ingested during exercise could improve performance. And it was a study written by Ed Coyle in 1986. He starved the people for 12 hours before exercise. That was the key. But I went back and worked out the metabolic state of those athletes as well. And I noticed that they didn't report the actual fat oxidation rates. 
they, they reported the carbohydrate oxidation rates. When I made the calculations, I showed that these people were the ones, when they took carbohydrates, they were burning fat at 1.2 grams per minute, which was the highest value ever reported at that time. And no one noticed it. Hmm. So who were these athletes in 1986 who were burning so much fat? The answer was they were Olympic class elite cyclists in Austin, Texas. Ed Coyle got some of the best cyclists and they were fat adapted in 1986. Hmm. Why? Because that was before the carbohydrate craze hit. And there's another lovely story that Paul and Yubi Fraser, who won the Ironman eight times and who won 28 Ironman triathlons, she's actually from South Africa. And she she was such a talent. She went to America after one year of training, came third in the Ironman the first time. And she phoned me and she said, Tim, I've read this paper. What do you think? Should I eat more fat? I said, yes, Paula, eat more fat. But at the time, I was promoting the high-carb diet. And she interpreted it as uh, she should go on a low-carb diet. She went on the low-carb diet. She won all these Ironman. And when she retired, she said, the best piece of advice I got was to eat the low-carb diet. And I said, Paula, but I never told you that. <laughs> Having developed type 2 diabetes as a result of following this high-carb diet and running 70 marathons or ultramarathons and still getting type 2 diabetes, I'm a bit more suspicious about the health effects of the diet of these recreational athletes became pre-diabetic when they ate the low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. They became pre-diabetic when they ate the high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet. Their control was absolutely perfect. And Andrew Kutnick, who was crucial in this analysis, showed that those athletes who burned the most fat were the ones whose glucose control improved the most when they went on to the high-fat diet. So that was the first time linking fat oxidation in muscle with more resistance to type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. The first study showing pre-diabetes developing without people putting on weight or changing their exercise habits. The only thing they changed was the diet. So it was a crossover trial. So essentially we had a low carb, high fat group and a high carb, low fat group. And then they crossed over at the midpoint. So they each did that, that diet for four weeks. Then they switched and did the other diet for four weeks. And so uh, what you're describing there is an actual onset of uh, these abnormal glucose dynamics as tracked by a continuous glucose monitor on, during the high carb, low fat portion. Is that right? That's correct. Now, do they represent all runners in the world? I would say they probably do, that 30% of runners eating this high-carbohydrate diet in their 30s or 40s, if we tested them properly, we'd show that they're pre-diabetic. When we started running in the 1970s, you trained really hard. And it, at the end of three hours, that was the end of the race. I mean, if you hadn't finished within three hours, there was no, no one hung around to, to see you finish in six or seven or eight hours. They were gone after three hours. And everyone was lean but really lean because they trained hard, but they didn't eat so much carbs. Now you go to these marathons and you see that people finish in six hours. They're a metabolic disaster. You know, they're carrying all this extra fat, but they believe because they're running, they're going to be healthy. And that's not true. And it's a simple, if you've got visceral obesity, if you've got a tummy and your waist is too wide, carbs are killing you. And mm. people have to understand that, you know, and the reason why I'm so vocal about this is I watched my dad die from type 2 diabetes and I couldn't help him because I didn't understand. 